Hi, my name is Pastor Tony Garbarino of Providence Presbyterian Church. We're delighted that you tuned in to hear a message from God's Word. If you'd like to find more information about us, please go to providencefw.org, providencefw.org. We seek to be Bible-based, gospel-saturated, and Christ-centered. So please enjoy now this message. Thanks for coming. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this, your word. We thank you for life in Christ. We do pray that as we come now, as we bask in the, the privilege of your presence, that you would be with us, that you would place that word in our minds, that we would think rightly, place that word in our hearts, that we would love in new ways, and place it in our wills, that we would act according to your perfect and glorious will. Lord, we thank you that you, uh, by your power, you can purge out from us what is unclean, we thank you and praise you for refreshing and cleansing and purity in Christ. Lord, we pray that your spirit would continue to work in us, to sanctify us, and to grow us evermore into the image of our faithful, glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. And we ask, Lord, that you would uh, indeed uh, be with us now as we hear. And so we come and ask you again, Lord, speak for your servants are listening. And this we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay. John chapter 16. John chapter 16, starting at verse 4. Please give your full attention. This is the Word of God. <clears throat> but I have said these things to you, that when their, when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because, they're, because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I say I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And then going to verse, I'm going to read chapter, verses 32 and 33. Behold, the hour is coming, indeed that has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. May that is a blessing upon it. As we are at preach now. Well, this is the last Lord's Day of 2021. Uh, we've made it to the end. Uh, most of us were happy uh, to be moving on. To, to the next year. Uh, there are many stressful and difficult scenarios that happen in our lives about which we are delighted are coming to an end. And on the other side of that, uh, we are sad. We are saddened when good things come to an end, right? When you've, I'm sure, experienced something great or enjoyable or good and then felt sad that it was coming to a close. Maybe on vacation or visiting loved ones far away. The time comes to an end, or perhaps playing your last game before graduation, uh, or the countdown when you're, to when your children are about to leave home. Events like these come upon us, and we realize this is it. When was the last time you encountered something good? It came to an end. We see in our text this morning, the end of Jesus' face-to-face -face teaching to his disciples. Right? It is the upper room discourse as it is called. Jesus will go, and go on in chapter 17 in prayer with his Father. But chapter 16 is the end of his uh, discourse, his teaching with his disciples. 
And he tells them about this N and his leaving and going away. And he tells them that though he is going away, though this time with them is ending, they are not to be sad and sorrowful. He tells them the main point in verse 33. He says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. And that is what's going on. That's what we're going to give our attention or focus to uh, this morning, that peace, true peace, that comes through the ministries of the second and third persons of the Holy Trinity. The ministry of the Spirit in verses 4 to 15, and then the ministry of the Savior in verses 16 to 33. We begin with the ministry of the Spirit, starting in verse 4. Right, we see here Jesus, he brings this wonderful teaching that he's been giving regarding the ministry of the Holy Spirit to an end, to a close. He wraps it up. And he says in verses 4 and 5, I do not say these things to you from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. Right, he's been teaching on this since the end of chapter 13. And he goes on in verse 5, And none of you asks me, where are you going? They haven't really, they, they have asked him some questions, but they haven't really got it. They haven't really asked the questions. He says in verse 6, but because I said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. These things he said to them are about his going away and about their imminent persecution. He told them in chapter 14 already, this glorious passage in John. He told them in chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. I will not leave you as orphans. Let not your hearts be troubled, he says again. Neither let them be afraid. Then he goes on in verse 7 of chapter 16. Even though I told you those things earlier, now you are filled with sorrow because I am going away. Nevertheless, he says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. And how many of us think and romanticize uh, how glorious it would have been to have been with the apostles, with the disciples in the time of Christ. To be with him, to be before him, to see him and touch him. And all of his beauty and glory. But the truth is, we are in a better place than they. We are in a better place than they. We have the Spirit residing within us. But he tells them this very thing. It is to your advantage that I go away. And we see in many, many ways how his absence is advantageous. Right, and it's all summed up in verse 7, he tells them. If I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You probably know that word helper there. Helper. It's that word we get the word paraclete from, parakletos. Uh, it's the advocate, right? The paraclete, the advocate, the helper. Jesus is our advocate, right? And his absence means another advocate, the Holy Spirit will be present. So what he tells them, and he goes on, uh, what he had told them in chapter, uh, two chapters ago in chapter 14, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, and what? He will be with you forever. Forever. And so let's continue to look now at this ministry of the Spirit, right? It is a twofold ministry. Uh, first we see the Spirit's ministry to the world in verses 8 to 11, and then we see in verses 12 to 15, the Spirit's ministry to the disciples, right? To the world and then to the disciples. Right, look at verse 8 of chapter 16. He says, And when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Significant here is that word conviction or convicts. Right? It's used just under 20 times in the New Testament about exposing, revealing, exposing sin and guilt and shame. Right? To the end, uh, the desired answer that people would repent. He says, convict of sin and righteousness and judgment, the ministry of the Spirit in the world. Of course, Jesus will go on to flesh this out in verses 9 to 11. We don't need to go into great detail this morning. It's not the purpose of uh, what we're doing, but at a surface level understanding of, the, of, these, of, of this verse and a basic reading of verse 8 is clear. Brothers and sisters, we are to be praying. We are to be a prayerful prayerful people, and we are to be praying, and one of the things that we are to pray and focus upon, particularly this coming year, we need to be in prayer for the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the world. Right? It's something that uh, far too often we think is just something ethereal or out there or too grand for us. We need to be praying for the ministry of the Spirit in the world, for the glory of God. And by the way, does peace come through prayer? 
course it does. Of course it does. We can't know all the ways and workings of God, but we can and need to be in prayer, right? That, that communication, that intercourse between ourselves and the Lord through the Spirit, through Jesus. And then next we see in verses 12 to 15, we see the, Spirit, uh, the Spirit's ministry to the disciples, right? Jesus goes on to say that when the Spirit comes, he will also have a ministry to the disciples. Look at verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. These teachings would come, however, through the other advocate. Right? He would communicate the truth to them. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Which truth is he talking about? This is also an important theme running through Scripture here, particularly the Gospel of John. Remember what Jesus said way back in chapter 8. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then in verse 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is the truth of Jesus Christ. Jesus gives them assurance that he will indeed do this. In the rest of 13, he says, For he will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. And If you're familiar with John's gospel, if this is familiar language to you, Uh, you will recognize this pattern. You will notice this pattern throughout. And I'll just quote a couple places through John uh, where we see this pattern and this, uh, what he's saying here. John 3.32, right? It's there where Jesus says about himself, he bears witness to what he has seen and heard. In chapter 8.26, I declare the word that I have heard from him. And then in verse 40, he says, you seek to kill me. The man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. And then finally in John 15, 15, he says, For all that I have heard from the Father I have made known to you. The Son has seen and heard from the Father what he declares to the world. And now we see here in our passage a similar pattern, right? He says, uh, we read that the Holy Spirit, he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak. Right? Whatever he hears and speaks, he will declare. Well, from where does he hear it? Where does, it, where does this come from? Well, notice verses 14 and 15. And these are glorious, amazing, incredible verses. He says this in verses 14 and 15. He will glorify me. How? For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Right? And so do you see this connection, this, this logical, this, this relationship between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? The Father sends the Son. The Son comes, and he acts, and he does, and he accomplishes, and he speaks. And then the Son returns to the Father and sends the Spirit. And the Spirit does and speaks the things that he saw and heard. Where? Well, it's in that relationship between the persons of the Trinity, right? That relationship that has existed from eternity, that glorious, harmonious agreement between the persons of the Godhead, that perfect interplay and execution and acting between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfection and wonder and majesty. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this or realized uh, what's going on here, but Jesus is about to leave, right? And their hearts are, are, are to be filled with, soon to be filled with sorrow. And what does Jesus talk to them about? You ever notice this kind of big picture, the big swath of what he's saying? He's telling them about the Trinity. You see that? There, there are many people who think that theology is boring or irrelevant or only for experts or simply divides, causes divisions. But those sentiments, dear Christian, are oh so misguided and unwise. And notice Jesus' is teaching here. It's not a dry lesson about philosophy or boring theology. I would contend that neither philosophy or theology are boring or dry. But he's teaching them something that is not boring. It's for their good and hope and encouragement and assurance and for their peace. Peace through what is to come. The Trinity tells us about this relationship between the persons of the Trinity about the essence of who God is. He's not an impersonal force, right? 
He's not a disinterested, disconnected entity looking down at how his creation is unwinding. God is personal. It's personal. He cares. He speaks. He acts. The one true and wonderful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the Spirit is going to speak to the disciples, right, who will become the apostles. He's going to speak the things of Christ, which are the things of the Father. Right? But what about us? Right? What about you and I today? We always want to be careful when we're reading Scripture and applying what we read. But we're not the apostles. Uh, we can't forget that. We need to remember that. But how do we know the things of God? Well, it's the same Holy Spirit takes the things of Christ and applies them to us. Right? The things the Son has taken from the Father, He speaks to us through His Word. But where do we find these true things that He speaks to us? In His Word. In His Word. Right? We know where it is. We have the words of the apostles, which are the words that the Spirit inspired for us to have. Literally, these things came to be, to pass in the lives of the apostles, in their understanding of scriptures, in their preaching, in their writings. But for us, what we need, we have, right? In our Bibles. The things that the Spirit of God wanted us to know are inscripturated. They were written down for us in this word, right? Isn't that awesome? We reflect upon that. Isn't that glorious? The God so caring, so loving, so true condescends to speak to us and preserve it for us, for our good and for his glory and our growth and our transformation and our uh, conformity to the image of his son. It is awesome. And that's the idea behind that line in that hymn that says, what more can he say than to you he has said? What more? We have the same truth that he's speaking of here. The Spirit attends that Word. Spirit and Word. Spirit and Word. Word and Spirit. He attends the Word in power whenever it is read and preached. We have that same Spirit as they did. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Word and Spirit, they go together. Study it. Read it. Read it again. Long for it. Pray through it. And read it again for life. For all of your lives. Seek to live it out. Get it into you. Get into it. It is God's means of grace to you, dear Christian. It is His way of challenging and exposing sin. It is His way of growing and conforming you and teaching you and equipping you and of killing your sin. And you know what else it will do? What else the Spirit will provide through His Word? It's peace. right? Peace. Blessed peace. Not as the world gives, he says, as he gives. Peace, brothers and sisters. Give praise to our almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for all that he's done, these glorious things. And then to our second half of our passage where we see brought to an end here the good things about the ministry of the Savior, right? verses 16 to 33. Like the ministry of the Spirit, we see that the ministry of the Savior is a twofold ministry. Is a ministry of joy and of peace. Ministry of joy, verses 16 to 24, and a ministry of peace in verses 25 to 33. Right? First notice it is a ministry of joy. Right? He says, a little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. This is what is said at the end of chapter 13, again, about his death and resurrection. This made the disciples wonder what he meant, right? In verses 17 and 18, they say, what does this mean? What is he talking about? And it says in verse 19, knowing this, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament right, because of his death. But the world will, re will rejoice. You will be sorrowful because of his death. But you will, your sorrow will turn into joy because of his resurrection. We'll see him again. Jesus explains this by way of an illustration. An illustration that every mother knows full well, that many of our mothers know recently or will soon, uh, uh, again soon know again full well. Right in verse 21, it says, When a woman is giving birth, 
She has sorrow because her, her hour has come, right? That intense pain and suffering. He goes on, but when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remains in anguish, remembers the anguish, for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Right? It all goes away because the thing is there, the child. It's glorious. And, you know, there's something about the suffering that all of creation and we have uh, in our longing and waiting for Christ to return, and the wrapping up of all things. Romans 8 talks about this. We suffer. Creation longs for this. And then in verse 22, he gives the point of the parable. You have sorrow now, but I will see you again. And your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. What a promise. Right? What joy. Never to be taken away. The joy of seeing him and being with him. And the joy and the reality, even now, of longing and the expectation of that. How remarkable. How wonderful is that? You want something to get excited about? That's it, brothers and sisters. That is it. This world, this word to the disciples is a word for us, even now uh, as well. Right? We have strife, we have sorrow, we have lament. Even and for some of us, especially during the season that we're going through. Right? It's easy to be led into depression and loneliness amidst all the celebrations and pomp and outward festivating. Right? We are submerged in it, and it's all around us. But very many of us, in the quietness of our souls, we hurt. I'd be hurt. We hurt because we've lost someone. We hurt because we're losing someone. We hurt because we are struck by the facade of it all. Right? And the reality that we don't have an idealistic, perfect, everything just right life. Sometimes we just want to be alone. Right? We get back to our normal routine where we've learned to bury it all out, just to bury it and drown it all out. You need, we need, all of us, to be reminded, brothers and sisters, to rejoice for the joy that we have in Jesus. Right? We need to learn to rejoice for the joy that we have in Christ. What does it say? Verse 22. I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. What a glorious promise. How often do we forget that? How often do we give our joy away to this or that thing or this or that problem? Remember this, brothers and sisters. This is joy, eternal, permanent joy for you who belong to Jesus, who have been joined to Christ and sealed by His Spirit. He's talking of the resurrection here, but he's also talking about his going up to glory, his ascension. Listen to what he says. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, He will give it to you. Right? The time is coming when he will, where Jesus will be gone, and they'll not be able to ask Him right, in front of them for anything but they'll have access to the Father in His name. He goes on, Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Right? Glorious indeed. And then the last part here of the ministry of the Savior. It's peace. Peace. He says, I said these things to you. Right? What things? Like being a vine and you being the branches like a woman's labor pain and joy. He said, I said these things to you in figures of speech. But the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. But the hour is coming, he says, when, he will, when Jesus will be raised and his disciples will grow you know, to maturity so that they, he can speak to them more plainly. He says in verse 26, in that day you will ask my Father in my name. I do not say to you that I will ask the Father in your behalf. Why is that? Because they can ask the Father directly, through Jesus, by virtue of Jesus, the mediator. Jesus explains in verse 27, For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. Right? And then the disciples answer, they respond, they say to him, now you are speaking plainly and not using figures of speech. Now we know that you are, know that you know all the things, uh, all things, and do not need anyone to question you. 
This is why we believe you came from God. And see how Jesus responds to this. He says, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. What does this happen? The cross, right? The cross. Listen, brothers and sisters. Listen to all who've ever thought they were alone, ever. He says in verse 32. Right? He says, you will leave me alone. And he says in verse 33, yet I'm not alone. For the Father is with me. I am not alone. The Father is with me. It's comfort, peace, peace in the presence of the Lord with the people of God. For you, belong to him. And then in verse 33, Jesus brings it all, all the good things about the Spirit's ministry to the world, to the disciples, and about the Savior's ministry of joy, giving joy, delivering peace. And he says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In the world there is tribulation, and anger, and discord, and distress, and chaos. But in Jesus, there is peace. Peace, oh the glorious peace from our union with Christ, sealed by the Spirit. What a glorious word for us. What a glorious word. I'm excited about 2021. I'm exhilarated about what is to come. What is yet on the horizon for us next year. We have a mighty God. And as we move into next year, I want you to be exhilarated as well. Though we will continue to have many, many things in this world to be disappointed about and discouraged about and worried about and upset about, those things will not end, they will increase. But even though something far, far greater than this world drives us and motivates our hearts and enlivens us, our hearts cannot be tethered and controlled by those things of this fallen world. The Lord has come. He's given us His Word. He's given us His Spirit. He's given us peace. He lived. He died. He has risen indeed from the grave. What glorious things to reflect upon again at this change of year, indeed of every day. In this coming year, I want us in Providence as God's colony of heaven here in Fort Wayne to be excited, to be focused, and to be in fervent prayer. Prayer for the church universal around the world. Fervent prayer for this church, for Providence in Fort Wayne. That we would be used of the Lord, effective for the work of the kingdom. And that our great God would work powerfully to change and comfort and sanctify us. That he would pour his spirit out in this area and fill his faithful churches with many, many souls, new souls, growing souls, thriving people, praising, celebrating God, praising Jesus. Because, you know, the very thing that the world does not have, though it pretends through many avenues to provide, the very thing it does not have nor can provide, Peace. And so I charge you, brothers and sisters, trust in Jesus. Trust in Him. Trust Him for eternal life, yes, but also trust Him every moment for this current life, even now, through all the tribulation. Remember that every day and every second is the time of trusting. It's a time of believing, of giving yourself over to the Lord Jesus Christ. With Him there's peace. With him there is peace. Let us keep focus on that promised peace. Let us keep watch out for those to whom we can share that peace. Right? Who need that peace. Which is everyone. Let us tell them that apart from the Savior, there is no peace. And let us tell them that the Savior and the Spirit and the joy and the peace that comes through union with the Savior, Savior and the filling of the Spirit. Right? You want peace? You want joy? How do you know that? How do you get that? You believe the gospel. 
You believe that Jesus lived and died and rose again so that those who believe in him would live forever in glory with him before the face of the Father. You believe that this morning? You believe it. If you've not believed that, I pray that you will do so right now. Now is the day of salvation. And if you have believed it, if you've given your life over to Christ, oh, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Rejoice. Rejoice and have peace and praise Him. And may you ever look to Him for grace and freedom. And when you fall and when you fail, for He promises, continue to look to Him, because His promise is to cleanse you and to refresh that soul. May this glorious encouragement drive you to live for Him and to sharing the truth and peace of the gospel, bringing others to hear His word, to be amongst His people with Him. May He be glorified in all that we will do to the end of the expansion of that glory as He see fits to expand His church. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for your word, your spirit. Lord, we praise you and thank you for all that you've done, that you've done everything that was needed to give us life. So Lord, we pray that you would help us to continue to more and more believe the truth of what you've given us, the truth of what you've told us in your word. Lord, we thank you and we praise you again and again for Jesus Christ and new life. Seal these truths to our hearts, we pray, Lord. Help us into the, moving into the future to be a praying people, to be a people that are fervent in prayer, Lord, and then we would live our lives preeminently for your glory, for the gospel, and for your kingdom. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you for tuning in this morning. Uh, if you'd like more information, uh, about Providence, if you're in the greater Fort Wayne area and would like to visit us, please go to our website, providencefortwayne.org. If you'd like to give, if you were blessed by this message, if you'd like to have more information about the faith or about growing in your faith, uh, we'd love for you to get connected with us. Thank you. We've set up a simple way for you to give to our church online. If you want to give a quick gift, enter an amount, select a fund, then enter your email address and your first and last name. Then enter your payment details and click Give. And that's it! We'll send a receipt to your email address. To use a saved payment method or manage a recurring donation, you'll want to log in. Click the Login button and we'll send a code to your phone or email account. Verify the code and you're in! Now your payment info is ready to go when you want to make a donation. To manage your giving details, switch over to the My Giving page. Here you'll see more ways you can give. You can also add a payment method, like a bank account or a debit card, set up a recurring donation, and view your giving history. To get started, visit our website or download the Church Center app in your Android or Apple App Store.